Patch Patch. Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee One, and joining me as always, it's John via the Skype from all the way out in Nassau County, and we're getting into the meat and potatoes of John's least favorite character. Is there a character in fiction? I know I asked you a character in Game of Thrones or a Song of Ice and Fire. I know Catelyn takes the cake, but uh, how about in all in uh, all of fiction? I don't think there's any, anyone greater. And you look at you know, my three or four main fantasy mythological Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, you know, Song of Ice and Fire, Battlestar Galactica. I mean, the nah, she's definitely number one. Yeah, she's number one. Why is that? I mean, I know why. I know why you don't like Catelyn. I know why I don't like Catelyn. But I think I mean, we mentioned this. I think the first on our first uh, episode when we talk, started talking about you know Catelyn Tully and the Tullys. Right. I go on YouTube. I go on many boards and feeds and topics. I've seen people say they like the character, but I've never seen anyone say it's my favorite character. She's awesome. Oh, she's my favorite. I've right. never there there I don't think you can find anyone that actually says that she is her favorite cat that you know, Catelyn Tully is the favorite, favorite their favorite character. I have problems finding anybody that even likes her or that thinks of her as anything more than the lady of Winterfell when the series starts. But saying that, I don't see a whole lot of people talking about how they don't like her or talking about how the decisions she's made, the mistakes she's made, how much trouble they've caused those mistakes have caused trouble for her family, for the Starks. I don't see people talking about that either. I feel like it's plain as day and should be plain as day to anybody that reads the series, even anybody that just watches the show, they should realize right. a lot of this is Catelyn's fault. There is a great meme. Um, I'm hoping I can, I can dig it out somewhere. And it is a great meme. And my I, God, I wish I could find it. Hold on a lot. I'm going to Google this right now and hope we can find it. In relation to Catelyn Tully, your favorite properties, I'm going to say, are Star Wars, A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, Battlestar Galactica, and Lord of the Rings, right? Mm-hmm. I don't really hate, I don't, you know what, with, with Star Wars, I don't really hate any, really, I really don't hate any of the bad guys. They're really kind of cool characters. C-3PO is the one I hate most in Star Wars. But Lord of the Rings, Sauron, Soromon, you don't hate them. I mean, they're, they're necessary. Battlestar Galactica is probably closer to Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire. Right, in terms of hating characters, yes. On paper, Catelyn Stark is a protagonist. She's a good guy. Well, actually, you know what? On paper, everything that she's done, maybe maybe she's not. Maybe she reads more like a bad guy. But you're supposed to, I think you're in, the intention was for Catelyn Stark to be an identifiable character. And yet, here you and I are making a podcast about how much we don't like her, how so much is her fault. And I just think that's pretty wild when you think about bad guys in Star Wars, bad guys in Lord of the Rings. They don't get nearly as much heat, nearly as much hatred from fans as Catelyn Stark is getting from us. And I guess the reason why is because Catelyn Stark is supposed to be a good guy. Right. And these, but she's re- but she's really not. Well, she's really not. She's, she's really pretty selfish. And the decisions that she makes, the repercussions of them, that's so much more frustrating for a reader compared to, you know, watching Palpatine, well, not Palpatine, but Grand Moff Tarkin blowing up Alderaan with the Death Star. I don't hate him nearly as much as I hate Catelyn. I don't even think of him in that way. I mean, I, I don't like him, but I, you know what? I kind of do like him because he's presented as a bad guy, as an antagonist. When you talk about how you don't like Ramsay Snow and Walder Frey, well, Walder Frey's not a good example, but Ramsay Snow, Euron Greyjoy, they're presented as bad guys, I think. I don't think in any way they're presented as good guys, and they do horrendous, mm-hmm. horrible things, but there's no bait and switch. George Martin isn't lying about who these characters are. Whereas with Catelyn, it's almost worse than a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's almost worse than Ramsay Snow dressing up as Reek to survive, befriending Theon, using the information he gains against him. Catelyn's almost worse than that in some ways because 
she thinks she's so righteous. She thinks she's doing the right thing. She thinks that she's like deserving of the bit of power that she has for herself. So compared to the two, for me, I mean, I know you don't like Ramsey Snow. I'm not saying I like Ramsey Snow, but as a bad guy, he's a pretty good bad guy. Whereas Catelyn Stark, as a bad guy, she's not a bad, bad guy either, but she's not presented in that way at all. She's presented as a good guy. And that's what's frustrating. That's why her character inspires anger in me. Whereas Ramsey Snow, it's more of an intrigue. Darth Vader is a tragic character, but no matter what horrible things he does, he redeems himself. You know, there's that struggle there. And as a bad guy, he's, he's a pretty cool bad guy. Any luck with that? Uh, any luck with the meme? <sighs> I'm so upset right now. I really just... It's on my Facebook, but it's like one of those pe- things that I, that I posted. I don't think it's going to be... You know, hold on. Let me go on my Facebook. Let me see if I can find it. It's something that I that I posted, but I don't think I have it like saved or anything. It's not like I'll go to photos. Oh. But yeah, she has like no... There is no redeeming qualities with her at all. You could argue that, all right, she's a good mother, but she's not really that good of a mother. You know, I'll find the three tomorrow, you know, when I, when I don't even need yeah. that out, but there it is. In terms of me not liking the character, Michelle Farley played her well, because I can't stand her in the show just as much as I can in the, in the books. Really? Yeah. I was at the movies yesterday, and uh, saw a, a Quiet Place. Uh, how was it? Eh, it was all right. It was different, you know. I'll give it that. It was different. It wasn't spectacular by any stretch of the imagination but did um, he fucking uh did jim look at the camera like with that with the jim helper face i was hoping he would and, uh, he directed it too i was hoping they like one of his kids dies and he just looks at the camera he's like doing that fucking smirk i was i was actually waiting i was waiting for it but he you know he didn't do it if he becomes like a like a like a big action actor that should be his thing you know like arnold's i'll be back or whatever yeah he's just deadpan at the camera they had a movie i forgot what movie it was yeah the coming attractions and um, I couldn't really tell. It might not even have been her, but I thought it was her, Michelle Farley. Oh, really? And I was like, already, I'm like, ugh, this week's got to suck. <laughs> <laughs> She's in it, it's going to suck. Well, you know, most of those actors aren't doing, I mean, with the exception of Sean Bean and, you know, hopefully some of the Stark kids. It looks like, shit, what is, what's Rob Stark actor's name? Richard, uh, Richard Madden. Richard Madden. Yeah, it don't look like he's going to make it too far. No, it doesn't. No, not <laughs> going to run out. I guess right now Sansa's getting the most work, right? Arya too. Macy Williams getting a lot of yeah, high profile yeah. stuff. I wasn't sure if it was her or not, but it looked like her. And I was just like, oh God. <laughs> Definitely not seeing this movie. Yeah. Before we get into Game of Thrones and Catelyn's narrative in a song of ice and fire proper, talking about the marriage alliance between Stark and Tully. And not to get too deep into that because we covered that plenty in mm-hmm. the Roberts Rebellion episode. But I I think it might be important to note the little finger factor with Catelyn and Brandon. Not so much what we were talking about last time with your great theory that Littlefinger put it out there that Rhaegar had kidnapped Lyanna when we know that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. And knowing the repercussions that would, that would come from people like Brandon and Robert Baratheon believing that Rhaegar kidnapped Lyanna. But going back just a few weeks further, possibly, Brandon Stark visiting Riverrun and the duel that Peter Baelish challenges him to. He had fallen in love with Catelyn. So when this betrothal was announced... Oh, found it, found it, found it, found it, found it. This is great. Found it, found it. (laughs) Sorry, I got to interrupt. Is it on your Facebook? It's on my Facebook. I'm going to share it again right now. Okay. It's a picture of Catelyn Tully. (laughs) And it's just like one of those, like, uh, you know, it's like uh, one of those, like, billboards you see on the highways. Okay. Betrayed her son... To try to save her daughters. Meddling. Some mom just can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it fits into a T. It fits into a T. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, I'm showing it right now. Betrays her son to try and save her daughters. Ugh. Some mom just can't help it. All right, well, I'm glad I found it. That, that would have bothered me. <laughs> I'll give that to her. Uh, she did want to save her daughters. Yeah. But I, I, at what a cost. 
The help my son who's who's with me and uh, my two other sons who are, you know, alone in the in the north. That's great. I gotta say that one. Um, all right. Anyway, um, all right. So going going back to uh, going back to Littlefinger, Lords Blackwood and Bracken came to Riverrun to settle a feud with the Lord Paramount of the Riverlands, Hoster Tully, to mediate it. And I guess they had a feast when they arrived, and Catelyn and Peter danced six times that night. He tried to kiss her, and Catelyn pushes him away, and it's not enough that she pushes him away, she laughs at him. So Littlefinger's wounded by the rejection. He gets drunk. We talked about this when we were discussing Brendan Tully. The blackfish carries him to bed so that Hoster doesn't see him in that state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lysa, Catelyn's younger sister, who had fallen in love with Peter, she snuck into Peter's chambers. They have sex, and Peter believes that he's having sex with Catelyn. Brandon was at River Run, 282 AC, and the date of their wedding was announced. And Peter gets the idea to challenge Brandon to a duel for Catelyn's hand. Do you think that Peter Baelish, let me rephrase that, the Peter Baelish that we know doesn't really seem like he is capable of love. He seems more to me like a sociopath. Do you think he was really legit in love with Catelyn? Well, I've challenged someone who's far bigger and far more battle-tested yes. to a duel. I'm going to have to say yes. You don't do that if you're not really fully committed. Well, at the same time, do you think that he... Like Littlefinger now wouldn't, would not be doing that. The Littlefinger that we know, do you think that that character was really born here. Like, do you think that Peter Baelish is more of an innocent kid until this moment and Catelyn spurning him, him losing this duel kind of pushed him over the edge and made him the heel that we know he is? I'm going to go with that, I think. Yeah. That really changes that changes his complete thinking and everything because he knew, he, he knew how, you know, listen, I, I can't beat anyone. I'm, I'm going to have to defeat people in other ways. When we were doing Robert's Rebellion, we talked about I mean, we talked about Rhaegar and Lyanna a lot over, over the couple of years we've been doing this. But other than that, right, that moment which set into motion most all the events of A Song of Ice and Fire, but you take away Rhaegar and Lyanna, this moment, Catelyn rejecting Peter, Peter challenging Brandon for her hand and losing this duel, take away Rhaegar and Lyanna, this moment has to be up there as far as events that occurred before A Song of Ice and Fire that really caused a lot of what happens in A Song of Ice and Fire to actually happen. So Brandon must have laughed at Peter when he challenged him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs> Catelyn does beg Brandon not to kill Peter, and he agrees not to. But Littlefinger was severely injured during the duel. The final cut that Brandon gave him was so brutal that Catelyn was convinced Peter would die from it. And I think the situation was that Brandon got more serious about the fight as the fight went on because Peter just wouldn't give up. He didn't die. He was given a fortnight to recover at River Run before he was sent away by Hoster. We talked about how Hoster probably should have been a little bit harder on him, especially with Hoster knowing that Lysa was pregnant because of Peter. Right, 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 right. Definitely. Catelyn didn't go to visit him while he healed, and she didn't say farewell to him when he left River Run. After the duel, Brandon also left River Run, promising to return for their wedding. And on the way back to River Run, when he does go to return, that's when he learns about the disappearance of Lyanna Stark. After Brandon dies at King's Landing, Peter Baelish sends Catelyn a letter, and she burns it without reading it. By that point in time, her father had promised her to Eddard Stark to keep the marriage alliance going. Mm -hmm. I don't know why she wouldn't read the letter. I guess maybe, maybe it hurt her too much to read it. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> That was probably that was like probably like Littlefinger's plan. By the way, I start the whole entire fight, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Leanna to get kidnapped, and she's out there burning it. Could that that letter could have saved millions of lives? If she had read the letter, maybe things would have been different. Right here, right before Game of Thrones, you could kind of argue she has a couple shitty decisions, and I'm gonna actually make note of them so we can have a we can have our big list when we're done going through this. But I'm gonna put down dancing with Peter six times at a feast. Nothing says, um... I'm into you, like, dance it, like, six times. You know, like, yeah. maybe one time, two times, okay, but six times, it's like, you know, you're kind of giving this guy the green light here. Yeah. 
And then when he tries to kiss her, she pushes him away, fine, but then she laughs at him. I don't know. Maybe that's not such a bad decision on her on her part. I'm just trying to gather all the evidence that we can. She does. Well, this is definitely a bad decision. She begs Brandon not to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> that's number one right there. Yeah. Yeah. The first one, at least. The first real big one. I mean, the, the first one you said that could be a little like, yeah, yeah, right. It's, we it's we, we get we get throw it in there as a you know to make the list a little bulkier than it is. Yeah, but the one with Brandon, please don't kill him. That's definitely up there. And then she doesn't visit him while he heals, and she doesn't read his letter. Again, you could argue that that's not that big of a deal, but I feel like if she had made right their relationship as friends, as the brother that she viewed him as, maybe Littlefinger wouldn't have turned into such a conniving prick that he became. Right. All right, so we'll jump ahead a little bit. Just after Robert's Rebellion, just before the events of Game of Thrones, Eddard helps Robert to win his campaign, and he does all the cleanup for Robert as Robert starts his uh, career of drinking and whoring at King's Landing. Ned returns to Winterfell with a baby that will be Jon Snow. He doesn't stop at River Run on the way back there. I don't know if there's anything to be said about that. Knowing Catelyn, I can't really blame him, but... Well, like, you know what it is? I guess he probably didn't want to, like, embarrass Holster Tully also. If he's, if he's home, uh, if I bring a baby, if right. I bring a baby there, I'm, like, showcasing this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's you a good know. point. Yeah, I was going to say maybe he had some business to take care of in the north. He had left Benjen to rule at Winterfell, and maybe Benjen made a mess of some things. Maybe he pulled a, he pulled a brand while he was there. <laughs> Either reason, I, I guess it's understandable that he gets there before Catelyn does. Catelyn starts her journey to Winterfell, where she will spend the rest of her life, and she has Rob, who was born in 283 AC at River Run. Just so our viewers know, I'm not sure if you, we, we did do a breakdown as best we can of when Oh my movies. god, yeah. And we... <laughs> I don't know where it is, dude. I can't <laughs> find it. It was so good, too. We were, de- we were, like, dead on. I think we were. I really, I think yeah. this really would have been the first, you know, like, of all the things we've ever really done, I mean, we've... This actually might have been the first thing we really <laughs> that could be considered, you know, cracking the code. The yeah, we'll we'll have to attack it again one day. I don't know, man. It, there's a file. I open it and it says the file is missing, and I was looking forward to uh, to putting that one up. Um, anyway, Maester Lewin delivered Rob at River Run, which is kind of interesting. Why was he at River Run? Yeah, I never, I had never, I, I did well, that. Well, I just. Forgot a name and decided to put Master Low in there. There's multiple Low in. <laughs> it just says in his history, presumably the replacement at Winterfell for Maester Wally's. So maybe he was the Maester at River Run and uh, he just got a promotion. Yeah. Then like, all right, go to River Run to go to Winterfell. After Winterfell would have been King's Landing or something. Yeah. <laughs> like you're, you're like, all right, Lewin, you're promoted. He's like, all right, finally. All right, you're going to Winterfell. Oh, Damn. <laughs> I hate the Starks. <laughs> yeah. So, Catelyn gets to Winterfell with her and Ned's baby boy, Rob, the heir to Winterfell. He will one day be Warden of the North. Do you think she's surprised to find Ned there with another baby? I mean, Ned probably gave her a heads up, I would think. I, from what I've always read, and there was no heads up. It was just like, oh, look, there's this infinite arms. <laughs> it's like, hey, oh, by the hey. way. I meant to tell you. Yeah, she was displeased. <laughs> Catelyn and young Rob travel to Winterfell where she was displeased to discover Eddard's bastard son, Jon Snow, had already been set up in the castle. Catelyn knew that men fathered bastards. Men gave Jon Rob for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just have to. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he, need, he needed a cradle. I didn't know, uh... You know. Rob's getting a smaller room right off the bat. <laughs> she had not been surprised to learn of Jon's existence because she knew that men fathered bastards. But John arriving at Winterfell before Catelyn and Rob, that hurt her feelings. Ned's insistence on raising the boy at Winterfell and his refusal to identify the boy's mother, that made her angry. John, your response to that? Well, see, the response to that is a lot of people bring up the question is how come Ned just couldn't tell her? Right. And my, re- my reply is, is always this. C- Catelyn betrayed her own son. You know, how easy would she betray, you know, Ned's promise and John's secret? Well, this made her jealous and angry. Good. What in hell? Well, she came to the conclusion that Ned must have loved John's mother deeply. And it turns out that he I did. Guess. He sure did love John's yeah. mother deeply because it was his sister. She hears rumors at Winterfell about a Shara Dane. 
which right off the bat, right there, since those rumors came out already, dis- disproves any of Shara Danish John's mother. Because why would George give that up right away? Right. If you're crediting George to be such an amazing writer that he doesn't follow the norm in any way whatsoever, and you have to find clues to figure out who is who, he's not going to put a red herring right there at the beginning of the story. And this is like the first chapter of Game of Thrones. Well, first Catelyn chapter. She hears those rumors, and she gathers enough courage to ask Ned about a Shardane. <sighs> My fair lines. Love it. It's the only time in all the years that Ned had ever frightened her. <laughs> he doesn't even answer. He just demands to learn where the rumor had come from. And what does he say? And now, my lady, you should tell me where you heard that rumor. Yeah. John is my own blood. That's all you need to know. Yeah, he's like, uh, bitch. Yeah, he's just like, never ask me about John. He said, cold is ice. He is my blood. Yeah. And that's all you'll need to know. They're like Michael Corleone talking, yeah. talking to yeah. Kay. Never ask me about my business, Kay. Exactly. Cutting. Just this once, I'll let you ask me. Is it true? Did you kill him? No. The only time in all the years Ned had ever frightened her, good. We know Ned well because he introduces us to Westeros and we get into A Song of Ice and Fire through his eyes, through his moral compass. We know Ned pretty well, but some characters, when they look at Ned, they do have a fear of him. The icy heart of Ned Stark. Yeah, he gets that sternness in him sometimes. Like yeah. That, like, wakes up the wrong side of the bed or suddenly it turns, like, you know, turns that switch on. Do you think that adds to his character that we never really get to see? That icy, cold demeanor, that that fear that Catelyn saw in her husband, that the intimidation he has for characters like Jorah Mormont? We don't really get to see that firsthand, and then Ned's gone, never to return. Do you think that adds to his character that we never see it, or do you think that his character would have been better rounded out if we got to see that. Because some of these remarks about him and, and his his icy cold heart, some of them are made long after he's dead. Storm mm-hmm. of Swords, Feast for Crows. Would you have liked to have seen him with that icy chill in his voice where he's it's like he doesn't care, he's ice cold, bad dude? Or do you think we saw enough of it? Would like to see more. But that might be part of the allure is that the character of Eddard Stark, as well as we think we know him, we do want to know him more. We want to see more with him. Mm -hmm. That's why the character works as well as it does. We'd love to have seen that dialogue in the the show. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, that would have been really cool. They can't still do that in a flashback, right? There's no reason to. God, please. Maybe they put on the DVD, maybe it was like a cut scene. How pissed would you be if whatever happens with the show happens, the ending or whatever, and then like all of a sudden like Catelyn wakes up in bed and it was all a dream? Ah, dude, done. <laughs> well, so I, I always say that that was going to be Bran who's going to wake up in a dream and be like, Uncle Jamie? Yeah. Right. <laughs> he's got, he's got, Bran's got bleach blonde hair. He's a Lannister. Because, like, Jamie is a, like, a, like a normal name. Of all these other names. And, like, you know, yeah. Jamie's yeah. one of the few, like, real, 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 real normal names. Yeah. We should do a show about that. Like, try to conceive the worst possible endings for Game of Thrones that we can come up with. This kind of hints that Eddard and Catelyn's marriage was. Not such a smooth ride. I don't know if I necessarily picked up on that in my first read. Besides this moment with the Shire Dane where she confronts him, it seemed like their marriage was a okay. But at the same time, they had been married for Rob is what fourteen when A Song of Ice and Fire begins. Yeah, it was like fourteen years. Yeah, they worked out their kinks over those years, but this implies that that their marriage had had some problems. Right, definitely not you know anything to overcome the John question. Right. John being the main problem for Catelyn and on Ned's part, the knowledge that Catelyn had been meant for Brandon. Right. And Ned's that kind of guy where he's filling in for Brandon. He's doing his duty. And, and he knows he's filling in for Brandon. He knows, like, you know, deep down, you know, like, my, you know, Brandon was a little more the good looking guy. I'm, um, you know, the, yeah. the mopey brother. This is all meant for Brandon. Regardless, they do grow to love each other over the years. I mean, I don't think they were ever madly in love. But they grow as companions, and they have four more children after Rob. Sansa, born 286 AC. Arya, born 289 AC. Bran, born 290 AC. And Little Rickon, born 295 AC. All delivered by Maester Lewin. As the Lady of Winterfell, Catelyn became familiar with all of the Lords of the North. I think it's in a Catelyn chapter when she reveals that she once had to comfort 
Lady Liness Hightower, who was Jorah Mormont's wife, because she was a Southerner. And she told Liness Hightower how she once fell out of place in the North, but she had come to love it all the same. Do you think that she did indeed come to love the North, or do you think she was lying to herself? Mm. Well, I think she, you know, I, I'm thinking about this because I'm thinking about the brand thing, but she'd still be in the North. So it wouldn't be like her not being in the North. No matter who she would have married, she was going to be in the North. Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking more about Rob's campaign now and, and when she does travel with Rob's war campaign for whatever the fuck reason she thinks she should be with a war campaign <laughs> and not in the North with her fucking crippled kid. Secretary of Defense. Yeah. She'd grown to love the North, but she's so quick to fucking abandon it. You know, maybe she was lying the whole time. Maybe she didn't really like it that much. You know, maybe Ned's death was like freedom for her. We'll get into all that, though. I'm just writing down, confronting Ned about Ashara. Okay. One more note before we get into A Game of Thrones. Ned had built a sept at Winterfell just for Catelyn so that she could pray to her own gods. Catelyn does not follow the faith of the old gods. She's a follower of the seven. And I guess that's a nice thing of Ned to do. Right. Maybe we don't put enough of a, a stress on how important religion was to the people of Westeros. You don't have a whole lot of entertainment. You don't have a whole lot of knowledge about why the world works the way it does. You do end up putting your faith in religion for these reasons. Faith was an important part of everyone's life. Catelyn coming from the South, she does not believe in the old gods. And I would think, I don't know what you think, but for a follower of the Seven, I would think that the old gods would seem like an archaic faith to them. Right. Backwards, almost like Native American Indians worshiping. I'm just making this up. I'm not saying that there's an actual Native American Indian god that rides a horse from one end of the sky to the other carrying the sun. But if they believed in that, we would kind of look at that, you know, coming over from Europe, believing in Jesus Christ, God. We would look at an idea like that and be like, uh, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, there's a, a great horseman that carries the sun across the sky every day. Sure. I would think she'd look at the faith of the old gods, knowing Catelyn almost as though it's beneath her. I like dying on them. Yeah, right. Yeah, like these gods. Yeah. <laughs> My gods are better than your gods. And if we go to Catelyn 1 in Game of Thrones... She does make note that she does not like coming to the Godswood. She didn't feel welcome there. And frankly, she probably wasn't welcome there. I don't yeah. think that the old gods would be that into Catelyn. Content. Get rid of her. Yeah. But in the first Catelyn chapter, she goes to visit Eddard. This is the first time we see Catelyn. Because in Game of Thrones, we have a prologue, and then we have a brand chapter. And then we have a Catelyn chapter. So it's our, our first chapter in Winterfell. We get introduced to all of the Starks over these few first chapters in the Game of Thrones. But in Catelyn 1, she goes to Eddard to tell him that John Arryn, the Lord of the Eyrie, Ned's foster father, has died at King's Landing. Do you think she's kind of nervous giving Ned this news? Or do you think it's more that she feels bad? She doesn't seem all that upset. And it is technically her good brother because her sister Lysa is married to John Arryn. Right, right. To, to, to brother-in-law. But she doesn't seem like she's all that upset about John Aaron dying. Well, we, we know she doesn't have a heart, so... Uh... Yeah. Well, at the same time, it's not like they're doing Sunday barbecues, you know? Yeah. I mean, John hadn't seen... Uh, John. Well, Ned hadn't seen John Aaron in however many years since... Probably since the Greyjoy Rebellion. Yeah, so probably nine years. But she makes note that Ned enjoys the quiet of the godswood. He had just beheaded the man. He's cleaning ice beneath the heart tree. She makes note that in the south, all the werewoods had been cut down, except for on the Isle of Faces, where the green men still maintain them. But every godswood in the north still has its heart tree. Catelyn tells Eddard the news, he takes the news hard, and then she tells him that the king, his friend Robert Baratheon, is on his way to Winterfell, along with the queen, their family, and like a thousand other people. He's not too happy to find out that Cersei's coming, but he's happy to know that his friend Robert's coming to visit. On your first read of Game of Thrones, what were your initial thoughts on Catelyn, on Catelyn Stark? Do you mean just the first book, all together? Just your initial, even after the first couple of Catelyn chapters, your initial feelings on Catelyn. Well, my first few chapters, I didn't really, right, my first few chapters, I didn't really, judgment was being upheld in, to further review. Yeah. And my second read, I did like this chapter a little better, but I, I think I remember getting a little tired with her when she goes to the Eerie. And it just seemed like that chapter took forever. 
Yeah, good point. We'll get to that in a minute too. But yeah, when she takes Tyrion. Yeah. We know that Tyrion, because we've been with Tyrion in his own point of view, but we know that Tyrion didn't didn't do the things that she's implying he did. And he makes good points to her, but she still presses on with this stupid journey. Yeah, I guess that's the first time I was getting frustrated with her. I was like, come, like, listen to the guy. You know, you can, you can save so much trouble if you, if you just listen to him. Robert asks Ned to be the hand to the king. He says he has to discuss it with Catelyn. I believe there's a difference between what Catelyn does in A Song of Ice and Fire and what she does in Game of Thrones on HBO. In A Game of Thrones from A Song of Ice and Fire, Ned is resistant to becoming hand of the king. But Catelyn warns him that he probably should do it because if he doesn't, Robert will suspect his loyalty. Right, right. Ned is still not convinced. He says that Robert would never harm him. He says that Sansa is too young to be betrothed. And Catelyn points out that she was 12 when she was betrothed to Brandon. There she goes again, though. There, see, this, here, this is right here, though. This is kind of a little bit of a meddling right there. This is a yeah. little bit. This is a little bit. I don't know if that's the reason that Ned chooses to become Hand. No. Just real quick, I think, on the whole entire patrol thing, you know, she's thinking about, like, oh, I was betrothed to be married Brandon. Ned's probably thinking, yeah, and Sansa's aunt was also betrothed to marry Robert and didn't want to. Then, you know, like, like what happened? You know, yeah. He's thinking of it that way, I think. Trying to protect Sansa. I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And it's not like that's a very good argument that Catelyn point, points out. And, and, and another and another little thing, one of the main things we're going to be talking about is Catelyn's wanting of power by getting her daughter married to the prince all of a sudden. Oh, now all of a sudden my daughter's married to the prince. I'll have even some more power. That's how she thinks. And Ned's not thinking of it that way. Ned doesn't want, you know, doesn't want that. Well, Ned's not power hungry, whereas Catelyn... Catelyn's like, oh man, maybe I'll be able to get the fuck out of Winterfell and yeah. maybe maybe I could be queen somehow. Yeah, queen Regent or something. <laughs> somehow queen. Everybody get, will love me. I'll get Cersei killed somehow. Yeah. But she's trying to convince Ned to become Hand and he's still resistant. Okay, fine. He's not letting Catelyn manipulate him if that's indeed what she's trying to do. But then Maester Lewin comes in and he delivers a... A small box with mirrorish lens and a note that was left in his chambers. The message is for Catelyn. It's from her sister Lysa. And Catelyn says that the message is written in a secret language that Catelyn and Lysa invented as children. She reads the message in this secret language and says that Lysa says Cersei murdered John Arryn. Then she says, Ned, now you have to become Han so you can find evidence that proves Cersei murdered John Arryn. And then Ned reluctantly agrees so it's like <laughs> it's like well you know if, if you don't become hand robert will suspect your loyalty and you know sansa maybe she's young but i was 12 when i was betrothed to brandon so it's not that big a deal and ned's like eh, i don't know and she's like oh here's a letter written in a secret language that my that my fucking crazy ass sister and i invented and she says that cersei murdered john and Ned's like oh all right well in that case in that case, I will become Hand. It almost seems, a little, the way you're pointing it right now, it seems very suspicious. Right? <laughs> it, oh, oh, it's a secret language. Okay. Oh, she says that, that Cersei murdered John. All right, well, in that case, let me just fucking leave the North. I'll leave it in your hands, and I'll bring my daughters down to King's Landing. You should have said that it was a secret language from the get-go. I would have, you know. He orders Catelyn to stay, rule the North in his stead, and to help prepare Rob to rule one day. Does Catelyn do anything like that? <laughs> Uh, he's also going to leave Rickon as he's still a baby, but Arya, Sansa, and Bran will go south with him. Catelyn begs Eddard to leave Bran, her favorite, as he is only seven. Ned points out that he was eight when he was sent to foster at the Eyrie. Furthermore, Sir Roderick informed him of bad blood between Rob and Joffrey, and Ned feels that Bran can help bridge the gap by becoming close to the royal family. This may all be true. Bran was a, a much different kid before the accident, before falling and, and becoming a cripple than he was after. And then we get the subject of what's going to be done with Jon Snow as Ned goes to King's Landing. Ned says, I can't bring him to King's Landing. He's a bastard and he'll be, he'll be ostracized. Do you think that's the real reason that Ned doesn't want to bring him to King's Landing? No. I mean, it could be part of it, but that's not the main reason. No. 
Yeah, he wants to keep that guy as far away from Robert as possible. Yeah, yeah that that was uh, yeah, exact. Well, exactly. I, and, uh, well, that was keeping him away from his rightful throne. But yeah. uh, it's so funny. Yeah, obviously, in this world, King's Landing to the north is too much journey. So obviously, you you don't want to go there too far. But it's it's funny how they haven't seen each other in nine years. Uh, you know, you just can't. Ned has to be people tell you, I can't let this guy see John. If he sees John and notices any kind of well, that, that was my that was my next question. You know, and it's kind of sidebarring from Catelyn, but I don't think I ever really thought too deep into it. But the feast when Robert arrives at Winterfell and Jon Snow is not seated at the high table, and he says it's because I'm a bastard. They don't want me seen at the high table, so he has to sit in the table off to the side or in the back. It's away from the dais. Mm-hmm. And I always took that at face value. And it may be at face value, but Ned doesn't come across to me as the type of guy that would ostracize his ostracize, even if it's a bastard. Um, nor do I think he would do something like that in his own home for the sake of Cersei. And I don't think that Robert would give a shit if Ned's bastard is seated by the Lord's table on the dais, but he still sits John out of view anyway. Probably that has to do with Ned not wanting Robert to see John. Mm-hmm. You think? I mean, I never really thought of it, but it it, it makes sense. And there's never any mention uh, of John and Robert meeting. Yeah, there's no like Robert ever talking about like, oh, I saw you bastard or something like that. Right. When they receive him, John's not there. Right. When when Robert's going through all the kids. Oh no! Yeah, no, he's in the he's in the back. He's not you know in the front uh, the front line. If Robert, you know, he calls Ned his best friend, like a brother to him, but he doesn't realize that Ned's not the kind of guy that would father a bastard, and he never, like, questions it, nothing. It's right there in front of him, and he doesn't even realize. Robert just looks at it like, yeah, it's my guy. Yeah. He got someone, too. <laughs> nice. Yes. I feel I feel better about what I've done now. Yeah. This just, uh, what's the room looking for? This, this just, um... Justifies. Yeah, yes, justifies everything I've done. <laughs> yeah. If Edward Strzok can do it, then it's okay yeah. I can do it 20 times over. Cersei literally catches him with like three whores and he's like, well, Ned fathered a bastard. <laughs> yeah, you let it him. All right, so Bran has his fall via Jamie pushing him out the window. Shortly after, Catelyn begs Ned to let Bran remain at Winterfell. She's got to feel bad about that, you would think. Mm-hmm. But then again, she has no problem fucking leaving him before he even wakes up. <laughs> You know? So eight days after the King's Party heads south, Maester Lewin comes to visit Catelyn in Bran's room. And Catelyn has, according to the text, has been in Bran's room night and day by his side in grief, as a mother should be. Maester Lewin comes to go over the cost of the King's visit and Catelyn's like, not having it. He says they have to name a new steward, a new captain of the guard, a new master of horse, as all of those offices went south with Ned. Catelyn's about to go off on Mr. Lewin, and then Rob comes in and says that he will take care of things. He questions her for not leaving Bran's room. He says Rickon has been following Rob around and crying because he thinks everyone has abandoned him and Rob. And Rob needs her help also. Catelyn is just not able to do anything. It's like she's in the grips of severe depression. But here's where we have the attack with the cat's paw. Bran's direwolf begins to howl, followed by the other direwolves that are at Winterfell, Grey Wind and Shaggy Dog. The library tower is on fire. So Rob rushes off to put the fire out. Catelyn's relieved that the fire is not near Bran. Then she sees a small man in filthy clothing with a knife who has come to kill Bran. They struggle. Catelyn cuts her hand badly. And then suddenly Summer, Bran's direwolf, is in the room, kills the assassin. When Rob and Maester Lewin return with Sir Roderick, they find Catelyn laughing hysterically. And she sleeps for four days. She then holds counsel with Rob, Theon. <laughs> Always include Theon in your secret councils. Maester Lewin, Sir Roger. Yeah, yeah right. Who, who she never trusts. Yeah. But let's just put him on a secret council. And Hallis Mullen, who is the new captain of the guard. Apparently, the assassin had been hiding in the stables. He had a bag of 90 silver stags. So he was obviously hired to kill Bran. Mm-hmm. But the question is, by whom? The Great Winterfell Council of whatever year this is. <laughs> the Great North Council. <laughs> 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 The, 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 it's like it's almost kind of like an impromptu tag, you know, four man tag team. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the Great Council of the Great Northern Mines. They figure out that somebody wanted him dead because he saw something he should not have. 
They note that the assassin had a Valyrian steel dagger with a dragon bone hilt. Hallis leaves to put more guards in Bran's room. The others continue to confer. Catelyn decides to tell the others about Lysa's accusations that the Lannisters killed Jon Arryn. These accusations delivered via a secret language. She keeps that news to herself. But she deduces that Bran did not fall. He was pushed. And she figures it was Jamie Lannister that pushed him since he remained at Winterfell that day. Rob draws his sword in anger and says, I'll kill them all. <laughs> and Sir Roderick's like, never draw your sword again. <laughs> Foolish boy. Catelyn makes note. She's surprised to see that Rob wears steel now. And then she decides that she must go to King's Landing with the dagger to discover its origin. <laughs> okay, like, all right, Sherlock. Yeah. Bad decision, you think? Well, I don't understand why she thinks that she has to go. Well, well, I mean, they had to deliver the knife, I guess, but did she have no, like, couldn't she just, just send Sir Roderick or, you know, I feel like Theon would have been okay doing something like this. You're not sending him back to his father. You're sending him to King's Landing to, I mean, he's a fucking idiot, so he probably would have messed it up. Sir Roderick asks to accompany her and she agrees. They take a boat out of White Harbor for King's Landing. And this kind of struck me as funny the first time I read the book because they make this big deal about Ned going to King's Landing, and then a couple chapters later, Catelyn's going to King's Landing after him. But in our next Catelyn chapter, she runs into Peter Baelish again. <laughs> and this will be this will be a long time since they've seen each other, right? This would be since the outbreak of Robert's Rebellion, since they've seen each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the City Watch finds her and Sir Roderick basically as soon as they enter King's Landing, and they escort her to Peter Baelish. Littlefinger tells her that he learned of her arrival at King's Landing from Lord Varys, the Master of Whispers. Varys joins them also. Peter asks why Catelyn is in King's Landing. She tells him that she wanted to see her husband. He's not buying it. You just, you're just like three days apart. Yeah. How can you miss him so much? She also says that the Tully words are family duty honor, and Catelyn would never leave her assigned post. Now, maybe he doesn't know her that well. <laughs> <laughs> Varys asks about the dagger, which he discovered through the whispering of little birds. She pulls the dagger out. Peter reveals that it was actually his dagger that he lost in a tournament held on Prince Joffrey's name day. T Tyrion Lannister. When Sir Loras Terrell unhorsed Sir Jaime Lannister, he lost the dagger to Tyrion Lannister. Just like the failing words, hook, line, and sinker, Catelyn agrees. Must be right. Must be Tyrion's. Let's say you're Catelyn. Years ago, this man professed his love for you, and he was going to duel to the death with the guy you're supposed to marry, and he almost dies while he's healing. You don't see him. You don't read his letter. You see him all these years later. Do you trust this guy? I don't think I could. You definitely, I, I, you would definitely think she'd be guarded, you know, yeah. uh, of his intentions, especially considering that all of a sudden he's, like, on the high council now, and, like, how's a guy like him get there? Yeah. And let's talk about that for a minute. How did Peter Baelish get to become Master of Coins? Well, he did it through his relationship with Lysa. When she marries John Aaron, she begs him to give Peter an office in the Erie. I think it was the customs office. Mm -hmm. And he ends up making a lot of money. So John Aaron gives him a bigger title and then finally brings him to King's Landing. When he goes down there, he works his way up to become Master of Coin. Never once... Does John Iron realize that Peter's there, you know, banging his wife the whole time? <laughs> and Catelyn, oh, you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Catelyn, and it's it's not like Catelyn. Like, do you think Catelyn knew that they? It was, she doesn't. She doesn't know that that Lysa no. was pregnant because of Peter. But you would think that Catelyn would know that Peter got to this place because of his relationship with Lysa, and knowing her sister Lysa, she might question that. She doesn't even think about it. She's just like, oh, well, Peter's master of coin now. All right, well, how did the son of, like, somebody who was not nobility, somebody who, like, was given a shitty plot of land and the title of lord, how did his son become master of coin? You would think all this stuff would be suspicious. She meets with Ned. She tells Ned that he can trust Littlefinger. <laughs> like <laughs> He's like a brother to me. He's going to help us. Don't worry. And Ned tells Catelyn to go back to Winterfell and to tell uh, Jojen's father. Holland Reed. Yeah, Holland, yeah. So Ned tells her, reach out to Holland Reed, have him put however many archers at Moat Kaelin. A smart move. Yeah, he's telling her pretty much, gear up for war because something's up. But Catelyn doesn't go back to Winterfell. 
again, she doesn't do what she's told by her lord and husband. She's on the way to Winterfell. She's definitely on the way back to Winterfell. Oh, man. And they decide to stop at the inn at the crossroads. There's a lot a lot of men in the inn that are sworn to River Run and her father, Lord Hoster. Now, did they even recognize her? Or did I, I forget. She was trying to travel incognito, and it, it had been a number of years since she had been at the inn. You know, she's not wearing her colors. She's not advertising that she's uh, Catelyn Tully or Catelyn Stark. And she's at the inn. She's pondering what to do next. She could turn west, and she can arrive at River, River Run and warn her father of the coming danger. She could go to the east, to the Mountains of the Moon, to the Vale of Arryn and the Eyrie. She hopes Lysa may have proof that could bring down House Lannister. But she decides that the best move is to go back north, which is what fucking Ned had told her to do. So I don't even know why she's pondering not doing that. Right. Uh, And once she's safe back in the north, she could send riders to her father and send riders to her sister. But there's a snag. There's definitely a snag here. They're in the common room for dinner. They're deciding to masquerade as father and daughter so they're not discovered. Marillion, the singer, strikes up a conversation with them. Tyrion enters with two of his men and Yorn of the Night's Watch. Catelyn's trying to keep her head down, but Tyrion notices her and calls her out by name. She doesn't say hi. She doesn't strike up a small conversation. She gets up, turns to all the men, service to lords that are... Sworn to her father. She courts their loyalty by saying, asking about their lords. And when she feels that they're all loyal, truly loyal to her father, to House Tully, she formally accuses Tyrion of conspiring to murder her son Bran and orders him seized in the name of King Robert. Uh, It's like whammy. Only because he's a Lannister. Yeah. Yeah. Any Lannister would have done. If Lancel Lannister moved in that, Lancel Lannister would have been arrested. What are some different things that she could have done here? Could have ignored him. Could have ignored got him. <laughs> maybe, maybe, leave, maybe leave like a walking comment or something like, you know, yeah. don't worry, last as your day will be numbered or something. She could have struck up a conversation, just gone back to Winterfell like she was told or, to do. Or, 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 or maybe she could have played smartly and tried to catch maybe little finger in a lie or, or find out more about this and just try to act stupid and be like, you know, by the way, there was this knife, this dagger I found. Um, start questioning that way. And then yeah. just leave off with any, you know, just agree with any answer he gave her. There's no proof that he did it. She was just talking about, well, she was just thinking to herself, perhaps my sister Lysa has the proof that can bring down House Lannister. Because she doesn't have it. All she has is that Peter gave that knife to Tyrion Lannister. That's all she has. Obviously, she put no thought into, into doing what she did. Because I feel like if she put even a little bit of thought, she would have connected the dots between Tyrion Lannister and Tywin Lannister. Right? And if you have that connection, if you realize, if you think about it for a second and you realize that Tyrion is Tywin's son, and you're not just embarrassing him in front of all these people, but you're taking him, you're capturing him in the name of the king for crimes of murder or conspiring to murder, wouldn't you think that Tywin might react to that? So obviously she's she's not she's not thinking at all. The only thing I can think of maybe she's you know well she a, she's being impulsive but maybe she'll have to, you know maybe Tywin won't do anything because it's the imp you know it's not like it's not like I'm arresting Jamie he'll know I mean business by doing this but won't care as much because it's not Jamie. Okay, fair enough. But another thing that she doesn't seem to think of is why is Tyrion here right now? Right, because Tyrion goes from Winterfell up to the wall. Back down to Winterfell. Back down to Winterfell, and now heading back to King's Landing, stopping at the inn at the crossroads. If he conspired to murder Bran, would he just go about his business remaining in the north? Or like like wouldn't he like hightail it out of there and go to King's Landing where he's protected? Or Lannisport, Casterly Rock, mm-hmm. anywhere south of Mulcalin. But she doesn't think about that either. She's just like, oh shit, oh, there he is, cool. They're south of Mulcalin now, but conspired to murder Bran for whatever reason, not that she can come up with a reason why he, Tyrion himself, would do it, but if he did, he's not just going to go lollygagging around the realm. He's going to take cover in case it comes to light that he was the one responsible for hiring this cat's paw to murder her son Bran. But she doesn't think about that either. She just captures him. Not only that, not only does she capture him, 
But now she gets all of these houses of the Riverlands, houses sworn to her father. Now she gets them involved in capturing Tywin right. Lannister's son. Earlier in the chapter, she's talking about going to River Run to warn her father about the coming danger. Later on in the chapter, she's totally fucking speeding that danger up without warning her father. She's putting her father in harm's way by doing what she's doing. No thought into that. She, None whatsoever. She's just, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? She's just, um, like winging it or can't get the word. No, no, she's just like getting everyone involved in a whole, a whole big thing based through her own actions. She's making all these co conspirators. She's like, are you loyal to House Tully? Well, yeah, obviously. All right, arrest this man. Yeah, arrest this man. <laughs> right. And less than a book, li- you know, later on in the book, now Gregor Clegane is setting the Riverlands on fire because of this. The next Catelyn chapter is their journey through the Mountains of the Moon, Vale of Arryn to the Eyrie. I like this chapter a lot. This is when they're attacked by the clans. The entire journey, Tyrion is, well, not the entire journey, but he's trying to reason with Catelyn and be like, look, you know, I get it. Somebody tried to kill your son. I understand. But why do you think it's me? Why would I do that? What is your reasoning? You're a Lannister. Yeah. He talks about the knife. Littlefinger's lying to you. You know, and then he says, you know, Littlefinger also said that he took your maidenhead. Like, Littlefinger said that. She's not listening to it. She's not having it. She presses on. It's just, it's my boggling. Yeah, because she's she's not listening to reason. You know, she seemed, in her first few chapters, a couple questionable decisions. She's not listening to Ned. Ned orders her to do something, stay at Winterfell. It's very important that you stay at Winterfell. She doesn't stay at Winterfell. Ned tells her, it's very important for you to go back to Winterfell and do all these things. She doesn't go back to Winterfell to do all these things. Okay, fine. But now it's like she takes a turn and she's unreasonable. Tyrion, maybe I could think of a more reasonable character in A Song of Ice and Fire, but Tyrion Lannister's right up there with the most reasonable characters who think of every side of the situation and take it into account before making a decision. You know, he could talk anybody into doing anything for the most part. But he is reasonable, and Catelyn's just not hearing it. She does make note that the sellswords that went along with them are particularly Bronn. Shit, and there was another character, I think it was Chiggin. I think Chiggin was his name, Mm -hmm. that hung around with Bronn. Him and Bronn were were like travel companions. Chiggin died in one of the clansmen's attacks, and Bronn has been hanging around with Tyrion, laughing at his jokes, and this is worrying Catelyn. They arrive at the Bloody Gate. I think it's Sir Vardis Egan is in charge of the Bloody Gate in the TV show. But in Game of Thrones, it's actually Brendan Tully. It's the Blackfish. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Yeah. Does that just seem like a little like, I don't know. like Yeah, it does, it does seem a little bit too neatly packed up. Yeah. <laughs> I can understand him not being at River Run with Hoster Tully, but. Oh, but he's here though. <laughs> and another popular place to be. Yeah. He rides out to greet them. They pass through the gate. Sir Willis and Sir Roderick, both wounded from their battles with the clansmen, they stay behind. Marillion, Bronn, want to continue with her and Tyrion, and she allows it, even though she doesn't like how Bronn is hanging around with Tyrion. She tells Brendan everything that's happened. Brendan tells her that the nobles of the Vale are angry that Jaime Lannister has been named Warden of the East, and many of them suspect that Jon Arryn was murdered. Well, so conveniently, they all said, oh, God, we had another Lannister involved. Yeah. <laughs> Not fishy. Lord Robert, little Lord Robert, John Aaron's son, is sickly and weak. Many of them felt that Lord Nestor Royce, who ruled the Vale for 14 years as high steward, while John Aaron was serving his hand, they felt that he should rule until Robert comes of age. Others believe that Lysa must marry again. She's rejected a dozen suitors. Thank God for their sake. Yeah. Well, she's saving herself for uh, Littlefinger. Oh, that's right. Brynden also says that Lysa may not be as helpful as you think she might be. She's changed. She's had two stillbirths, four miscarriages. Jesus, I forgot about that. And she's crazier than ever. She's crazy as fuck, dude. <laughs> and wait, wait till you see the son. Wait till you see your nephew. <laughs> yeah. When's the last time you saw your nephew? Just be your prepared. Father, your father would be proud. <laughs> yeah. This honorable man will be so proud. Now, this is something I want to make note of because I'm not sure how I want to put it, but so basically, Nestor Royce greets them and he says that Lady Lysa has asked for Catelyn to be sent up to the Eyrie right away. Catelyn's like, it's dark. Can't I wait till the morning? He's like, nah, she wants to see you like right now. So a young woman, Maya Stone, who ends up being one of Robert's many bastards, takes her to the top of the Eyrie. Catelyn has to climb up 
It's a journey that takes her past three-way castles, stone, snow, and sky. The path gets narrower and windier Mm -hmm. as it goes up. By the time Catelyn reaches the last way castle, the sky, she's too nervous to continue the journey. And she's instead hauled up in a basket that they use to bring food up. So I just find that interesting because she couldn't complete that journey to the Eerie. You've, you've always found that interesting. You've always, you've always like, I've told you, know, you, I told yeah. you before about Sansa, right? Because then Sansa yeah. does the same thing in A Feast for Crows and, and she does finish the journey. Not that I'm trying to downplay what, you know, what you might think that I, I always, always thought the impression there might be something more to it the way you were saying it. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, no, it, it, there's, it, there's really nothing to it except that. Catelyn and Sansa are a lot alike. Yes. But Sansa is a stronger character, like her or not. She's been through more than Catelyn in her short life, and she's just a stronger character who's willing to do the impossible. Well, not the impossible, but she's she can do something that Catelyn could not do. Catelyn was too scared to finish this journey. Sansa was able to. I just think it's interesting how alike the characters are, and it's more of a George Martin thing in his writing uh, that I find it more interesting than... It really meaning anything at all other than Sansa's a, a stronger, braver character than Catelyn. Mm-hmm. But Catelyn gets to the top. She's greeted by Sir Vardis Egan and Maester Coleman. They take her directly to Lyser, and her sister's smiling, happy to see her until everybody leaves them alone. And then she like turns into a fucking werewolf, bro. She's furious that Catelyn brought Tyrion to the Vale and dragged her into a quarrel with the Lannisters. Catelyn's like, but you wrote me a secret letter in our secret language saying that, you know, the letter just killed John Aaron. And I handed you one. <laughs> yeah. Lysa says she never meant to fight them. She only wanted to hide in the Eyrie. And as they're talking, here comes the Lord of the Vale himself, little Lord Robert. He is very sickly. Ugh. And he gets scared at the shouting and Lysa begins to breastfeed him. Catelyn's like, what the fuck is going on here? Why is she breastfeeding a fucking four-year-old? Lysa wonders out loud what to do with Tyrion, and little Robert stops breastfeeding for a moment and says, he asks if they can make him fly. I remember I really got into the story after this chapter. As weird and gross as that is, it's way engaging to meet a character like that. You're like, holy shit, what the fuck is up with this chick and her son? Jesus. In a Tyrion chapter, Tyrion figures a way out of the sky cell that they're holding him in, Mm -hmm. demands a trial by combat. He demands for Jaime to be his champion. And Lysa's like, nah, nah, we're not waiting that long. And that's one of my favorite parts of, of that whole entire thing is the fact that he wants Jamie. It's like, you feel like, oh, I'm not fair. I got my brother. I'm like, yeah. got Jamie last. You're done. You're done. I got Jamie. You're done. Yeah. And like, Lysa's like, I know I'm done. That's why you're not getting him. <laughs> so instead, it's Bronn that will fight for Jamie, uh, that will fight for Tyrion. Just real quick, I think that really kind of adds to Jamie's persona like his like the mythos yeah, exactly i think that scene really helps add that the fact that right away she's like no we're not waiting yeah no terry has no problem waiting another two weeks in that freaking room as long as he knows his brother's coming Lysa's like yeah we know you're gonna choose jamie bro we know not happening we're not waiting that long and catlin has a bad feeling about from the guy from right from the get-go she just knows already like well she's seen braun fight firsthand she's seen yeah, she knows, yeah, exactly. She he, she knows that she's he's kind of a deadly fighter. But be that as it may, Sir Vardis Egan, who's going to fight for Lysa, he's armored, and Bronn has no armor. Yeah, Sir Vardis Egan was all, like, armored up, like, freeing yeah. Conan, <laughs> freeing war against the Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> like, Robocop. And nobody thinks Bronn has a chance against Sir Vardis Egan. Yeah, like, they see all this shiny armor on him, oh, this guy's done. All the High Lords of the Vale have gathered at the Eyrie to watch this fight. They all want to see Tyrion Lannister fly. And it makes sense. It's understandable because the Blackfish was just saying that the Lords of the Vale believed that Jon Arryn was murdered and that the Lannisters are responsible. But before the fight, Sir Roderick gives Catelyn a report of what's going on since she's abducted Tyrion. Jaime is gathering a host at Casterly Rock. Edmure Tully has demanded to know Jaime's intent. He ordered Lords Vance and Piper to guard the pass below the Golden Tooth against this host that Jamie's gathering. Hoster Tully was not mentioned. Catelyn figures he must be very sick if he's given the charge of the defenses of the Riverlands to Edmure. He must be fucking close to death if he's letting Edmure run things. <laughs> Catelyn now decides that she must return to Winterfell like Ned told her to fucking do. Yeah. You know what? Ned was right yeah. after all yeah. this. <laughs> you know what it is? After I just start all this bullshit... 
backfired yeah. on me. I'm just gonna go home now. I made no one know I did anything wrong. Yeah, she's like, this didn't work out quite the way I thought. Now <laughs> River runs under attack. Backtracking. Fucking Edmure's in charge. Tyrion seems like he's gonna go away scot free. So yeah, we're gonna go back to Winterfell now. Ugh. Sir Brendan joins Catelyn. He had asked leave of Lysa to take 1,000 men and march to the Riverlands to help Edmure. Lysa refused to send men to help her brother. So he resigned as Knight of the Gate. Catelyn convinces him to join them on a ship back to Winterfell. Catelyn tells Sir Roderick that Robert is unfit to rule, little Lord Robert, unfit to rule and must be taken away from Lysa. Maester Coleman tells Catelyn that John Aaron actually agreed with that and was going to foster him at Dragonstone with Lord Stannis. That would have been a sitcom, right? Robert, <laughs> little Lord Robert fucking fostering at Dragonstone with Stannis. <laughs> <laughs> and watch off the entire season of that. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. That'd be a fucking awesome show. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean your mother breastfeeds you? <laughs> Bring the red woman in. Yeah. Burn this guy. We <laughs> sacrifice it to the Lord of Light. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, that would be so awesome. <laughs> uh, Catelyn says that Maester Coleman's mistaken because he had heard that Robert was going to Casterly Rock to foster with. <laughs> That's season two right Lord there. Lord Tywin, yeah, hell yeah. Just have, <laughs> have him go all over the fucking Seven Kingdoms. Uh, Mace Terrell. Well, at least thanks to Terrell, I think like, maybe that would actually... Oh, she, oh yeah, your, your mother breastfeeds you. All, all right, let me let me see if I can find a, find, find a, milk, a milkmaid. Um, so before they can finish the conversation, Tyrion's brought in with Bronn and Sir Vardis Egan shows up. Vardis is fully armored. Bronn is wearing only male and a half helm. A Septon blesses the trial and the fight begins. Catelyn has a memory of Peter fighting Brandon for her hand. Bronn dodges around Sir Vardis, darting this way and that. And Catelyn realizes his game plan is to tire her out the heavily armored Sir Vardis Egan. And when he is near exhaustion, Bronn closes in and begins pressing him fiercely. Vardis makes one final bull rush to try and end it at Lysa's command, but Bronn darts aside. He topples a statue on top of him and delivers the killing blow. Lysa realizes she must free Tyrion, but orders him and Bronn to be put out on the high road, where she believes they will die. I always felt bad for Sir Vardis Egan. Not so much in the show, because in the show they make him out to be like, uh, pff, you're not armored, it's no problem. But in the book, he is, if I remember correctly, he's pretty hesitant to fight Bronn at first. Yes, yes. When he was so exhausted, and Lys is like, finish it now, Sir Vardis. And like, he tries to, to do what his lady commands, but he just has nothing left in the tank. But I did love that scene. I love that uh, the, whole, the whole sequence at the Eyrie. Catelyn and Sir Brendan meet up with Sir Wendell and Willis Manderley. So it seems that, let me just look at the map real quick. Yep. Yes. Yes, indeed, the Erie is way fucking north of the Riverlands. And way north of Mo Kalen. So it seems that Catelyn's not going back to Winterfell. She's going to meet up with her son, Rob, who's marching on King's Landing. So by this point in time, Ned has been arrested for treason and put into the black cells. All the great lords have received All a- All because. Right. I don't think we really need to get into what Tywin does, because we went over that plenty during the War of the Five Kings, but mm -hmm. I guess we'll leave it at that. When he learned that Tyrion was taken, he attacked the Riverlands. I think the important thing is, is that if Catelyn had thought about it for a second, she would have realized that Tywin would seek vengeance, let's say, when he found out that Tyrion was, was taken captive. But she didn't think about that. All of a sudden, she leaves the Eyrie, and guess what? The whole fucking realm is at war because of this. Oh, shoot. She's like, did I do that? Uh. Whoops. So Rob has called the banners, and he's marched south, leaving Rickon pretty much alone at Winterfell, but no big deal. Bran woke up from his coma, Mom. Don't worry. So the Manderleys have answered the call. Pretty much all the major houses of the north answer Rob's call for the banners. So Wendell and Willis Manderley meet Catelyn and Sir Brendan as they arrive. Their father, Wyman Manderley, he stayed behind at White Harbor to see two defenses. But basically, he's just become so fat he can't sit on a horse. Catelyn sees, yeah. Catelyn sees Rob's host coming into view. 
She rides through Moat Kaelin with Sir Wendell and Sir Brendan, finds Rob with Grey Wind, surrounded by his lord's bannermen. Sir Helmand Tallhart, the great John Umber, uh, Robert and Galbert Glover, Roos Bolton, Hallis Hornwood, Rickard Karstark, and Theon Greyjoy. And of those names, how many of them will fucking stab Rob in the back before this is over? She informs Rob that Sir Roderick is on his way north to serve as Castellan of Winterfell. Okay, she sends the bannermen away to speak to Rob alone. And the way she does it, she said, my lord's totally paraphrasing, but you would excuse a mother wanting to have a moment alone with her son she hasn't seen. And the lords understand and they they leave them to it. But I feel like a guy like Roos Bolton, great John, I feel like all of them, these northern, these hard northern men, this would be like a loss in the respect column for Rob to have their right. mother, to have his mother right. dismiss them away to speak to him alone. It's not that she missed him. I mean, I'm sure she did, but that's not why she wants to talk to him. She wants to know what the fuck's going on and how she can get her fucking fingers in on it. I need to be involved in this. <laughs> so, I didn't start any of this. Yeah. I need to be involved in it, though. <laughs> what? All right, I did start it, but I do want to still be involved. So Catelyn says she fears for Rob's safety and she wants to send him back to Winterfell. But she knows she cannot do that without causing him to lose face. Rob tells Catelyn about a letter from Sansa, which told him not to fight and to bend the knee. We don't really need to explain the letter from Sansa. It was Cersei telling Sansa what to write, and Sansa writing it wholeheartedly, thinking it would solve all the problems. Catelyn realizes that Sansa is now a hostage. Rob has 18,000 men, but he's afraid of what might happen to Eddard and Sansa. Catelyn assures him that victory in the field is now the only option. Is she right? I mean, pretty much, right? Unless he's going to yeah, bend, I, unless he's going to bend the knee, right? And even then, my consequences. Yeah, I mean, either way, Sansa's staying at King's Landing, and Ned is. If they're lucky, they'll get him to go to the Wall. But Rob tells Catelyn what has transpired in the Riverlands. The host that Jaime was gathering at the Golden Tooth smashed a force led by Lord Vance and Piper. Lord Vance was slain. Lord Piper fell back to River Run. Lord Tywin came up from the south with an even larger army. And that ambushed Lord Beric's men from King's Landing. Sir Raymond Darry and most of the men from Winterfell were killed. Lord Beric may have escaped, but no one knows for sure. Rob has ordered Howland Reed to bleed any Lannister host that comes north, but knows that Lord Tywin is too smart to go north and will more than likely stay in the Riverlands, taking castles one by one to isolate Riverrun. Rob feels he has no choice but to ride south to meet him. His plan is to split his horse and his foot the foot will march on Tywin and draw him in while the horse races to River Run to surprise Jamie. Catelyn's actually, she's impressed by this plan. And she asks who Rob wants to have lead the, the foot. And Rob says, well, I was going to give Great John the command and I'll command the horse. Catelyn points out that the Great John is too brash. As in, he'll lead his men to death for glory instead of following what needs to be done for the mission, which is drawing Lord Tywin away. Uh, Rob decides to, instead to give Roos Bolton the command. What for someone brash to someone uh, who's been a house who's always been out of Oz the Starks? Good going. Team Tully. This is definitely, it turns out to be a wrong decision. Putting Roos on his own with part of an army to command. It ends up biting him in the ass, but at the time, it seems like a good decision, I think. Because the idea is you want someone clever, someone crafty, who will be able to distract Lord Tywin and keep those men alive. Great John will, like a kamikaze run, whereas Roos will... Attack and run, attack and run. But giving Roos that freedom, it has dire consequences later on. So I don't know if I could put that down as a bad decision on her part. It's a wrong decision, without a doubt. But I don't know if it was necessarily a bad one at the time. It seems like there's thought put into it. But here's the bad decision. Rob tells Catelyn he will prepare an escort to take her back to Winterfell. And Catelyn's like, nah. She's like, dude, I ain't never going back to Winterfell. I'm going to go see my father. I'm deep in this right yeah. now. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm going to win this war. Be queen of the seven kingdoms. She says that with her father dying, with Edmure surrounded, she must go to them. And that's what she does. All right, so this is the chapter with Walder Frey where we're introduced to the Lord of the Crossing. And time is of the essence. Rob's host moves south. He's heading for the twins. Lord Walder has amassed a master force of 4,000 men. Catelyn watches Rob and how he... Functions as as Lord, as head of this big army. She notes that every day Rob meets with a different Lord and listens to his input. She realizes that's like that's quite a Ned thing of him to do. Yeah, that's a Ned thing. Ned always had them at the dinner table. 
She talks about Lord Walder with Rob. She tells him that she fears Lord Walder will be unfaithful to his oath. Sir Brendan is commanding the Outriders. Theon is riding alongside with him, and he rides up to Rob and Catelyn to report that Brendan has crossed swords with Sir Adam Marbrand's Outriders for the Lannisters, and they've killed a dozen. So Brendan's job basically is to take out the Lannister Outriders so none of them can see Rob's army when it splits. Rob has surrounded the twins with bowmen to take down any ravens. Lord Walder, it turns out, has killed some Lannister scouts that wandered onto his lands, but he is holding back his main strength. There's really no other place, when we were talking about the Riverlands itself, there's really no other place to cross except for the twins. So Rob has to have the crossing. The next day, Sir Brendan personally reports on the battle at River Run, and they learn that Edmure has been captured. <laughs> oh. <didn't> take <laughs> Rob's angry at Lord Walder because he's not helping out Edmure, who was his liege lord. He doesn't know what to do. Catelyn tells him he must negotiate. So Rob arrives at the twins with his army, flanked by all his lords. The gates are barred. Rob's bannermen concur that neither assault nor siege will break the fortress. Four of Walder's sons, led by Sir Stevron, his heir, come out to greet them. Sir Stevron reports that Lord Walder wants to speak with Rob inside. The northern lords are outraged and make their displeasure known. Catelyn, however, seizes the moment and says she will go instead. Sir Perwin Frey remains behind as a hostage while Stevron and the others take Catelyn inside. This isn't that bad of an idea on Catelyn's part to go and negotiate for Rob. All right. You now she knows Lord Walder. It's not been the show in the in the sense that they're worried that Walder's gonna, you know. Well, if he has hostage, right? Because if he has Rob, then that's it for the northern campaign. You know, right? They can't risk that. Yeah. But you know, you're you're letting Catelyn now negotiate, <laughs> right? But at the same time, you can afford to lose Catelyn. So it's strange. It seems like against her type now for her to not only make that realization and follow through on it, but at the same time, she does get to negotiate, which noble ladies don't generally get to do that. So I'm sure she's looking oh, forward she's to much, it. Oh, she's loving it. Loving it. Look, look, look at all this. <laughs> I'm in charge of a, a war camp. When one of the people in charge of a war council, I'm negotiating deals. I'm accusing people falsely of murder. This is great. Yeah. So she meets with Lord Walder and... His entire family's there. Lord Walder is rude to Catelyn, which embarrasses Sir Stevron, his heir, and Walder's bastard son, one of his many bastard sons, Rhaegar. Walder insults her father and her brother, too. squinted worm with the dragon's name. Yeah, Rhaegar Frey. But she endures his insults. Walder is bitter with Lord Tywin for not asking for his help. Lord Hoster for not coming to his last two weddings. And also for not having Edmure marry one of his daughters. He's mad at John Aaron for not taking any of his grandsons to foster, sending Robert to foster with Stannis instead of with him. Catelyn is surprised by this, as she thought he was going to be fostered with Lord Tywin. They make a they make a big to do about this fostering of little Robert Aaron, and it never really comes to fruition. Um, but well, you know, by the time I got up to the second book, I completely forgot that I was setting this huge fostering triangle up. Robert Aaron Quagmire. I was going to be a great story that would have had a lot of impact in the end game, but I really can't go back to it now because I'm talking about the Martells. Walder assures her that it was Stannis that Robert Aaron was supposed to foster with. <laughs> Whatever. They finally get down to business and they work out an agreement which Catelyn brings back to Rob. Rob may cross and Walder's men will join him, minus 400 that will stay to hold the twins. In return, Catelyn will foster two of his grandsons, Little Walder and Big Walder. And Rob will take Olivar Frey as his squire. Elmar Frey is to wed Arya, if she is alive. <laughs> and Rob is to marry one of Walder's daughters after the fighting. His choice. Rob agrees. And I feel like he kind of did a Catelyn decision right here, not thinking too much into it. But he agrees. He decides to leave Sir Helmin Tallhart at the Twins with 400 men and... That evening, Rob crosses with the majority of his horse, while Lord Roos Bolton stays on the other bank and marches south to confront Tywin. So things are looking good for Catelyn and Rob and company. Well, except for the fact that Ned's in the Black Cells, Arya might be dead, Sansa's a hostage. <laughs> things are looking pretty good. The brand, who knows what, is paralyzed and Rickon's 
running around with his fucking crazy direwolf. Other than that, things are looking okay. So we have Catelyn chapter 10. And this is after the battle at the Whispering Wood, which this is the only firsthand account we get to it is of the end of the battle. And I guess, I don't know. What do, what do you think? Do you think this is a battle we really needed to see firsthand? The Whispering Wood? We get the gist of what happened, but we just don't get the firsthand right. a- account of it. And what we get is Catelyn sits on her horse. She's surrounded by 30 men. And they're led by Hallis Molin, captain of the guard. And they are ordered to take her back to Winterfell if Again, the battle goes, right. if the, well, only if the battle right. goes ill. Even though she should just fucking go back to Winterfell. Yeah, she should go there back there now. Rob moves among the men preparing for battle. Sir Brendan reports that Jamie does not know they are there. He has 12,000 foot and two or 3,000 horse in three separate camps besieging River Run. Lord Jason Malister has joined his strength to Rob's, and whatever was left of Edmure's host that retreated after the battle before River Run have also augmented Rob's force. According to their information, Jamie will ride out often. So they prepare a trap for the next time Jamie rides out on one of his frequent raids. Catelyn watches Rob ride off, and she hears the battle unfold. When it's over, Rob rides back with Theon, Galbert, and the Great John to present Jamie Lannister, his new prisoner. Jamie Lannister, however, during the battle had killed Eddard and Torn Karstark and Darren Hornwood. He killed them trying to reach Rob before he was captured. And I just, I always picture that. And this is where, for me, the, the intrigue with Jamie Lannister started. Because this is the first time you really get to see, well, you don't get to see it, but you, you hear how good of a fighter he is. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he cut through three sons of noble lords just trying to get to Rob. Like, he knew that if he killed Rob, this is all over. And he almost got to him. You know, he cut down those, those young men and he almost got to Rob. But they capture him. Rob's forces also capture Lord Gowan Westerling, Lord Quinton Bainfort, Willem Lannister, Sir Garth Greenfeld, Sir Titus Brax, and Cleos and Tion Frey. Some of those characters will come into play later on in A Song of Ice and Fire. Mm-hmm. But the point is that Rob has won the day. They've freed Edmure. They've got River Run back. They broke Jamie Lannister's host. So things are looking up. And this is the last Catelyn chapter in Game of Thrones, Catelyn 11. Rob and Catelyn, they prepare to enter River Run by boat. Theon and Grey Wind are in the boat with them. The Great John, Lord Rickard Karstark, Sir Brynden Blackfish, they're in the next boat. They are greeted by Sir Edmure, Lord Titus. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> and they offer condolences to Catelyn for Ned's death. At this point, Ned has been beheaded on the steps of the Great Sept of Baylor. Edmure takes Catelyn to see Hoster, who is also dying. He's happy to see her, but seems extremely disappointed that Lysa did not come too. He asks if Brynden has wed yet, and I guess Catelyn says no, but she goes looking for Rob, and she finds him praying in the godswood, so she waits. When he is done, he comes and tells her that Renly Baratheon has declared himself king, and he's going to call a council to decide what to do. So in the Great Hall of River Run, the Great Lords gather. Hoster is too sick, so Edmure is there with Sir Brendan at his side. Roose Bolton has reported that he has reformed his army at the causeway before Moat Caelan, while Lord Tywin has crossed the Trident and is making his way for Harrenhal. So there's uh, confusion as to what to do next. Sir Mark Piper urges a strike at Casterly Rock. Lord Titus wants to finish Tywin at Harrenhal. Lord Jonas feels that they should declare for Renly and squeeze Tywin between them. Lord Jason Malister says they should bide their time since they are blocking Tywin's line of supply. Sir Stevern Frey thinks they should make peace <laughs> and see who, see who wins between Joffrey and Renly, but that's shouted down. Rob's undecided. I mean, we know what they do. Right. See, it's, is there, yeah, it's, oh, t- is there, it's tough to, like, you know, answer that because you know what happens, you know, like, you know. Yeah. Like, you, Strike Casterly Rock. That's what he ends up wanting to do, right? At the end, yeah. There's no army guarding it. Titus wants to finish Tywin at Harrenhal. That's probably not such a good idea. Lord Jonas, he wants to declare for Renly. That might not be a bad idea. But, status. Exactly. A a, a lot of this, you know, we're going to go on and on and on about Catelyn Tully, but another huge problem with the World of Five Kings that we've touched about it numerous times, numerous, numerous times, is... The whole status Renly thing. And yes. They could have somehow oh, man. just 
you know, none have done what they've done and has had Stannis as the guy, then it's so much easier to rob a line with Stannis, double team the Lannisters. You don't want to be king. Let Stannis be king. Kill off the Lannisters. Right. Yeah. Easy. Win win. Nice, win win win. Nice and easy. <laughs> win win win. Win win win. Win win. Michael Scott. <laughs> Home for dinner. Poster on the back of Oscar's shirt. Win win win. <laughs> yeah. It should have been a lot easier and it should have been. It should not have been a Lannister victory. Those fucking Baratheon brothers. Rob points out that Joffrey is the true king. So Renly can't declare himself king. But Rob cannot bow to the Lannisters because they executed his father. Renly has the might of the Reach and the Stormlands. But Stannis is the older brother. He has a better claim. Catelyn comes in. She swoops in and makes an impassioned plea for peace. And they shout her down. She's like, my lords. I've done everything I could to start this war. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She doesn't say that though, right? Imagine that. She's like, "Uh, listen, this is all my fault. Let's plead for peace now. now. Now that your sons are dead and, you know, we lost a lot of people. Finally, the great John jumps up and says, he will bow to Rob as the king in the north. And everybody immediately agrees and offers fealty to Rob. In one moment, he becomes king, not only of the north, but the north of Wands. That was the last Catelyn chapter in A Game of Thrones. And Jesus, I was so pumped after reading that chapter. The words rang out in her father's hall, king in the north. King in the North. King in the North. John, what were your thoughts after reading that chapter in A Game of Thrones or watching episode 10 of season one? I loved it. Yeah. And I thought, this is definitely before you see all this stuff unfold. So you don't really realize all the the bad she really does. Yeah. You're just seeing this like, oh my God, they won this big battle. Rob's called King of the North. He's going to go down south. He's coming for you, Joffrey. He's coming for you. This is it, revenge. Well, I think that's the important thing to note is you don't look at the mistakes she's made. These are possibly the worst of them. Well, now I'm sure we'll get to more, but these are some bad decisions she's made, particularly taking Tyrion, because that's what starts the physical conflict. But you don't think about that at this point in time, even though the main character, even though what was most likely everybody's favorite character in this book, Eddard, even though he's executed, and whether it's because of her taking Tyrion, or you could argue that that was his fate all along because the Lannisters needed to remove him. It's questionable if you can blame Ned's death on Catelyn, but a lot of other deaths you can blame on Catelyn, but that's not what you're thinking when you read this chapter, when you watch episode 10. You're you're psyched because Rob is going to take up the mantle of his father and he's going to get that revenge. And he's already won a major battle and he's captured Jaime Lannister, who seems like he's one of the main antagonists of a Game of Thrones. So things are looking great for Rob, even though R is missing, even though Sansa is a hostage, even though his father's been killed, even though his brother is paralyzed, even though his other brother's going to have fucking major fucking psychological issues being abandoned by his entire family. It still looks like things are up for Starks. Therefore, Catelyn is not sitting pretty, but she doesn't look so bad right now. It's like all those decisions she made are like, been like worth it so far. You're right. We're not far enough along to where bad things have happened to where we're going to start blaming people for things. You know, it's when things start to go bad for Rob that we can start blaming them either on on Rob for listening to his mom or on Catelyn for not fucking going back to Winterfell like Ned told her to do. It's a perfect play until it's not a perfect play. Yeah, pretty much. Let's stop there. And when we meet again, we'll go through a Clash of Kings where she... Catelyn, I feel like... Her character changes a bit between Game of Thrones and Clash of Kings. And it's easier to see her for who I think and you think she truly is, which is kind of like a power hungry. I mean, she's, she this starts like building her life off her son's kingship. I think it's a combination of that and the fact that her lord husband is dead. And the fact that Rob is still kind of young. And even though he's king in the north, he still needs, he needs his mom. It's almost like she's choosing to stay by his side, not so much to guide him, but to kind of siphon off. The power that's come with him being king in the north. Because she should really fucking go back to Winterfell, dude. Like, she should go back now. But she doesn't. She always finds a reason not to. There's always something. Always something. There's always, oh, hold on. You need me for this. That brand's fine. What do you mean he's paralyzed? Eh, you know. Your grace, we need someone to jump over a mountain of lava. (sighs) I'll do it. (laughs) Unbelievable. (laughs) Unbelievable. That's Catelyn Tully Stark for you. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. You can find us, facebook.com slash 
The Promised Princes. Follow us on Twitter, at Princes Promised. We're on Tumblr, we're on Instagram, although we don't really post too much at all on Instagram. Read the Westerosi Companion at theprincesthatwerepromised.com. Please find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher. We're on SoundCloud. We're on YouTube. Search for The Princes That Were Promised. Subscribe. Please leave a review. We will be back to discuss Catelyn as she goes to visit Renly and gets Rob and herself into an increasingly more dangerous and worse situation with every decision she makes. See, how else can I fuck shit up? Can I get my son killed somehow? (laughs) Uh, Maybe I'd be queen of the north. All right, John, always a pleasure. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll talk to you later. Bum, 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 bum.